Hi everyone, good afternoon, good morning to some of you. We'll get started in just a few moments here. Uh, before we do get started with today's presentation, I would like to go over a couple quick housekeeping issues with all of you. Uh, we do have a number of people on the webinar here today, and uh, just to improve with everyone's overall audio quality, when you do sign into today's webinar uh, on the uh, control panel itself, you've got two options to join, which is either to listen through your computer speakers or to call in using your telephone. If you are dialing in on the telephone, make sure you choose the option on the screen before dialing in. This will greatly improve the audio quality uh, for today's presentation and reduce any unwanted feedback or echo. So make sure you've got the appropriate option selected on your screen. On that same control panel, you can also ask questions to today's panelists, who we'll introduce in just a minute. Uh, we'll take time for questions at the end of the presentation, but please do not feel like you have to wait until the end to, to ask your questions. Type them in here. We'll try to address as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. We always get a lot of questions about the webinar recording and the PowerPoint presentation, and we are recording today's presentation, so we'll send out a link after the webinar if you want to view it again in the future, and we'll be sure to provide any slides or any other pertinent resources that are mentioned during today's presentation to you in follow-up emails. Now, follow-up emails with the links to the presentation are usually sent within 48 hours of the end of the webinar, so you should receive those by the end of the week. And uh, if you have any other questions, you can type them in here in the panel. So that's the basics to get us started here. And uh, moderating today's webinar, I'm going to turn it over to Ned Logren from CJCA. So Ned, tell us a bit about why we're here today. Okay, thanks a lot, Brendan. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Center for Coordinated Assistance to States, uh, CCAS, uh, as it's better known, a webinar, Reducing the Use of Isolation in Juvenile Confinement Facilities. My name is Ned Lochran. I'm the Executive Director of the Council of Juvenile Correctional Administrators, better known as CJCA. And I'm here with Brendan Donahue, who you just heard from. He's the Technology Manager for the Performance-Based Standards Learning Institute, who is producing this webinar. And joining us from New York City is Sharon Pett, who is working with CJCA on the CCAS Training and Technical Assistance Project. The Center for Coordinated Assistance to the States was developed in 2014 with a grant from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Uh, the purpose of the center is to assess the need for and coordinate the delivery of training and technical assistance designed to build capacity within states, territories, tribal units, and communities to maximize the effectiveness of juvenile justice systems to the benefit of the youth they serve. The focus of the center is on providing ongoing coaching to achieve individual and or behavioral changes that possibly impact the juvenile justice system. Joining OJJDP, our partners in this initiative of CCAS, are the American Institutes for Research in Washington, D.C., and the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform at Georgetown University. And so now to today's webinar. Today's learning objectives are to increase knowledge about the impact isolation has on youth facility residents. The second is to highlight key steps to reducing or eliminating isolation in detention and correctional facilities. And th the third is to present real life examples of how facilities have reduced the use of isolation. So why are we focusing on the use of isolation? Well, first of all, uh, performance-based standards defines isolation as any time a youth is physically and or socially isolated for punishment or for administrative purposes. This definition intentionally excludes protective and medical isolation. I think we all know that research shows that placing a youth in isolation has negative public safety consequences, does not reduce violence within facilities, and can harm the youth psychologically, physically, and developmentally. CJCA has a strong position on isolation. We believe that isolating or confining a youth in his or her room should be used only to protect the youth from harming him, herself, or others and if used, it should be for a short period and always supervised. Our topic today is one that CJCA and the Performance-Based Standards Initiative has been working on for most of the 20 plus years of our existence, 
and are pleased to see reform across the country now more than ever before. The impetus for CJTA's webinars on reducing the use of isolation began at the CJTA Leadership Institute in October 2014, when more than 40 CJTA members, the state directors of youth corrections, spent the better part of two days discussing the use of isolation and resolved to develop a strategy to use the examples of youth correctional agencies that had significantly reduced its use to assist other agencies and reliance on isolation to manage facilities. Just last year, CJCA published a toolkit reducing the use of isolation, and that toolkit is available on the CJCA website under publications. So we welcome all of you to today's webinar, but I want to give a shout out to the teams from six youth corrections jurisdictions that applied to CCAS to receive training and technical assistance to reduce isolation. They are the Alaska Division of Juvenile Justice, the Mississippi Division of Youth Services, the Montana Department of Corrections Youth Services Division, Los Angeles County Probation Department, Maricopa County Juvenile Probation Department, and Siskiyou County, California Probation Department, the Charlie Bird Youth Correction Center. Our presenters today are Faraboy's Baxaresh, the director of the Oregon Youth Authority since March of 2012. Our second presenter is Peter Canola, who is the facility program director for the Indiana Department of Corrections Division of Youth Services. And our third presenter is Peter Forbes, the commissioner of the Department of Youth Services. And so with that, I'd like to turn the webinar over to hear from Faraboy's Paxaresh who is um, not only is he the director of the Oregon Youth Authority, is also the vice president of the Council of Juvenile Correctional Administrators. So fair boys, it's all yours. Thank you, Ned, um, and great to be with you all. Um, you know, the piece that I'm going to be talking about is um, fairly straightforward. Uh, most of you probably already know about this stuff. I'm going to be talking primarily about culture. Um, and, okay, so let me go back. I forgot that um, I can't be too quick on this stuff. So um, I'll go to the right slide here. A um, few moments of delay. Here we are. And so really what I'm going to be talking about is the importance of culture as it relates to all of your leaders. And what we're talking about here is actually a different way of looking at things and a different way of doing business. Um, so the bottom line is we're talking about a culture change. Uh, pretty much that's the trend now um, in juvenile justice across the country. And as I looked at various definitions of culture, um, I found this to be speaking to me. And this is from a book written in 1992 by Richard Daft. Um, and you know, for those of you who might just have the audio, I'll read this. He defines culture as a set of values, guiding beliefs, understanding, and ways of thinking that is shared by members of an organization and is taught to new members as correct. So basically, our old employees are constantly teaching our new employees about our culture. Our culture represents basically the unwritten and a feeling part of the organization, and it provides people with a sense of organizational identity and generates in them a commitment to beliefs and values that are larger than themselves. So with that, the question then for us become, why should we focus on culture change? Again, what we're talking about here is reducing um, and eliminating isolation. And in order to do that, um, what it requires, and I'm trying to get the next thing to come on the screen here. Here we are. So really, we are thinking about moving away from old way of thinking. We can also call it the old paradigm. And the old paradigm was that isolation is effective, and that it works that it makes us safer. But as Ned just explained to us, um, you know, at least within the recent years, we have realized, and many of us have realized for many years, that it actually could things make things worse. It could um, make the safety environment 
more difficult and more dangerous for our staff and for youth. And the use of isolation is not uh, the best approach in deten detention and uh, youth correctional facilities. So um, quite often what we do when we're trying to change something is we write new policies, we put new procedures in place, we print manuals, and all of those things are necessary in order to make changes in organizations. But they're not enough by themselves. Um, in order to move to a new way of doing things, we have to actually begin a new way of thinking, which requires a shift in mindset. Um, that is really what's necessary to take us to this new environment that we all want to move into. Uh, culture change can also help align our practices with, um, I'm basically saying emerging knowledge, and what I mean by that is we have learned a whole lot within the past 10 or 15 years about what works and what doesn't work. I mean, we are constantly refining our practices. There's a whole series of new evidence-based research emerge that shows us what works and what doesn't. So um, now we actually have an opportunity to incorporate that, that new research and understanding in the way that we want to do business. Okay, let me go to the next slide here. So I want to speak just for a moment about the important role of leadership in organizational transformation. Um, again, it doesn't just take leadership to change the culture, but leadership becomes essential and primary in order for us to move this change within our organizations. The most important aspect of this for us leaders, and I'm talking about all uh, 262 of us who are on this webinar um, is that we as leaders need to understand the impetus for change. Why are we doing this? We need to be very clear uh, ourselves before we try to communicate it to others. As leadership of our organizations, we have to embrace this change. We have to be advocates for it. We have to be able to talk about it. We have to be able to explain why a change is necessary. Why are we doing this? And we also have to have a strategy. And we need to understand that this is a gradual movement. Uh, change does not occur overnight. Because really what we're talking about is moving from an existing world to a new world, from an existing paradigm to a new paradigm. So I want to talk just for a moment about five different strategies um, for us to actually begin to put this new culture, to instill this new culture in our organization. And the first of those is we as leaders need to make, be able to make both a human and a business case for change. Um, we have to be able to articulate the human cost of the existing way of doing business. Uh, we could be inflicting trauma. Uh, we actually could be putting community safety at risk. Because if we are not producing and returning kids back to the community um, in a better shape that we receive them, then we are not doing our, our job. Uh, the second piece of this is the monetary impact, the fiscal impact of this. Um, use of isolation could lead uh, to longer length of stay, meaning we could be spending much more money on maintaining the same population that we have. And then what is uh, the cost of a future crime. What's the cost of a life? Uh, that's unquantifiable. I mean, that's basically priceless. So, um, we go to the next slide here. Uh, the second strategy that I want to talk about um, is the importance of engaging our staff in this transformation process. And it truly is a transformation process. Um, all of us have seen efforts, various efforts, in organizational transformation. And as we know across the board, the majority of the organizational transformation efforts fail because leadership fails to include employees and those, those people who actually do the work in the transformation process. In order for us to be successful, we have to be able to win the hearts and minds of our staff. Um, we have and, you know, the second point is pretty important. We can spend a long, a long time on it, which we don't have, but really understanding the difference between power and force. 
Uh, meaning power is authentic. It comes from within. Force is external. You know, most of the kids who have come to us have come to us because of the use of force. And what you, we are trying to teach them is to discover their own authentic power within. And as we begin to implement this change within the organization, we also need to be mindful that we are not forcing this change into the organization. Instead, we need to act with authenticity. We need to be very clear about what we're doing yet, and we need to bring the staff along with us. We have to help them see the point of change um, and actually involve them in the every aspect of the implementation process. Those of us who have unions, and, and, you know, labor who's opposed to this thing, we need to make sure to have them at the table. We need to have uh, the leadership um, of the union with us. We also need to involve outside advocacy interest groups. Um, if you have a community advisory committee, bring them in. You know, there are advocates on both sides of this change. Make sure that we are actually including them because otherwise, just trying to move this thing forward by ourselves, we are not going to succeed. The next strategy that I want to briefly talk about is if we are asking our staff to do something different, to approach things differently, to do things differently, we better be able to provide them with the tools, the training and the skills that they need in order to make that change. Um, and as you all know, um, as we all know, adults don't necessarily just learn uh, in classrooms. Um, the, the better part of learning for us occurs uh, when we're actually shown. It's action learning that needs to happen in the work environment. Um, you know, in Oregon Youth Authority, and we can talk about this in future sessions, we actually have skill development coordinators that are working with staff on the living unit showing them how this change is possible. You have to see it in order to know that it actually works. The other thing I wanted to briefly mention is that we do have to expect setbacks and challenges. Um, you know, you might actually see a, a short-term increase in uh, isolation as you begin to implement this thing. Uh, don't get too discouraged by that. Again, this thing is not going to happen overnight. It's going to take time as long as we are doing the right things and as long as we have staff with us and engaged. If we can balance being really persistent, but at the same time having patience, we begin to see that the culture ultimately moves and we can actually see that our efforts are effective. The fourth point that I wanted to talk about is if we are doing something different, we also need to be able to measure it. We also need to be able to show that it works. How do we know if you're spending X amount of hours or dollars in a process, uh, if you're actually getting the, feed, uh, the uh, results um, that we expect? So we have to set targets. We have to be able to measure performance. It is very important to reward good behavior, both for youth and staff. And as you begin to see incremental success, even one or two cases that you're seeing, you know, the needle is moving, we have to pause. We have to recognize uh, the people who are actually responsible for that change. We have to celebrate their successes. And ultimately, getting the organization focused on the desired outcomes and success. In the public sector, we are really good at talking about what we do. Um, we are not so good about showing the outcomes and the results of the actions that we actually uh, undertake. So metrics and performance measures become pretty important in this process of transformation and culture change. And finally, uh, what I want to talk about, and this is one of the most, most important aspects of leadership, is we have to be able to model the change that we want to implement in our own organization. If we're talking about core values, we have to be able to model and demonstrate those core values ourselves. We have to be able to walk the talk. How we treat staff translates directly into how um, staff treat youth. Um, if we begin to take care of the staff, um, there is a much more probability that the staff actually begin to take care of youth. So this whole concept of um, walking the talk, being authentic, being the change that we actually want to see in our organization, not just 
for myself as a director of this organization, but in all layers of management um, as we interact with staff. Um, it becomes pretty important. So that's pretty much my part of the presentation. And you know, I'll uh, join you again for questions and answers. And I will turn this over to my colleague, Mark, at Indiana Department of Corrections, Division of Youth Services. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Fairbores. I wanted to begin with uh, saying that I'm probably going to echo a lot of the strategies that he already mentioned with some specifics about what we've had to do in Indiana. Um, as Fairbors had noted, you know, changing the culture was the number one thing we felt we had to do in order to reduce isolation in Indiana. Our biggest challenge was that we had a very adult-minded correctional division uh, with a lot of the same policies and procedures as adult facilities. You know, oftentimes in the 12 years I've been with the department, the pendulum swings back and forth. But we had swung very far back into a, a very much an adult model. And uh, so we had a, a long way to go when we first started working on this. Another thing we had to overcome was staff's perceived fear for safety. They reported that using isolation was their best or sometimes only recourse for feeling safe. Um, one of the first, oh, let me go back a second. One of the first steps that we took was recruiting the right staff. And in order to do that, we started from the top uh, to begin changing this culture and, and looking at what line staff would be working with our kids. We first had to separate ourselves out from the Indiana Department of Correction, and we're still part of it, but we reestablished ourselves as a division of youth services. And we created our own youth-focused vision, mission, and values, quite significantly different from uh, what the Department of Correction has for the adults. And then with that in mind, we started uh, committing ourselves to hiring new staff who wanted to work with youth and, more importantly, help change the lives of kids. To echo this uh, new mission and vision that we had, we changed our line staff's title, uh, job title from correctional officer to youth development specialist. And in, at the same time, we also changed the description of their job to fit working with the youth as the main focus rather than, I mean, there's still safety and security as part of it, but a lot less of accountability and more accountability with, all, with also a helping uh, aspect to their job title. And then to, to also echo this change, we changed our dress code. We had previously been in a, a law enforcement style uniform. They, uh, our staff almost looked like police officers, quite frankly. And we went back to uh, a, a more polo style um, khaki pant look that we felt was more relaxed and would fit more with what, what our new mission was. At the same time, we revamped our interview process by adding job shadowing to it before we even hired uh, the person. This way, potential staff could come to the facility and experience firsthand where they would be working and what they would be doing with our students and really get a taste of, of what the job would be prior to even accepting the offer. Um, at the same time, we had our superintendents meet with each job candidate prior to offering employment to discuss our mission and to emphasize our focus on youth development. We felt that hearing it from the top person at the facility would, would reinforce that this is what the department's trying to do and the particular facility uh, that you're working at will be doing. The next thing we had to do was to uh, take a look at and revamp our training to fit our new vision, mission, and values. And this way that we could uh, introduce our new model to new staff, but also get back with our veteran staff and slowly bring them along with the changes we wanted to make. Prior to this, all adult and juvenile staff went through the same training. Um, it focused on adult correctional concepts. And, and really what ended up happening was even our staff would come out of that first new employee training being feeling like they were adult correctional officers. Uh, even I went through the same thing. I had very much a culture shock when I came through uh, training in the Department of Correction. Um, I thought I was coming to work and help kids, and I, and I did not feel that way after I got through training. Um, what we've had to do is our, our first four weeks of training is still combined with the adults. However, because we need to cover uh, general DOC policies and practices and topics. But now there's always an adult trainer and a, a specially trained juvenile trainer who co-facilitate the first four weeks. And this way, 
throughout the entire process, the, the juvenile trainer can either separate out the juvenile staff in their own little work group. They can also go through juvenile-oriented scenarios and examples, and also constantly be reminded how the ju juvenile side is applying the DOC policies and procedures on our end so that they can see the differences. And then even more importantly, we added a full week of juvenile-specific training that we call the, the Making a Change or MAC Academy. And at MAC Academy, this training focuses, number one, on understanding adolescent development and working effectively with each stage of adolescent development. So really redefining our youth um, from, from where they are as far as in their development as an adolescent and getting our staff to understand that their mindset is going to be different than what we might expect. We then added trauma-informed care in order to help staff understand the underlying issues that result in a lot of the youth behaviors that we see in our facilities. And as a result of doing that training, our staff report that they now see youth in a different light, more as victims of neglect and abuse than perhaps the more correctional-minded, offender-minded um, way that they thought of youth before. We also added motivational interviewing and conflict resolution training, and this was to help uh, staff learn ways to de-escalate and refocus youth, not through using isolation, but with increased positive engagement. So doing the exact opposite. Rather than having a student acting out and we remove them to a room, we now said no, if a student is acting out, we want you to engage them even more. We want you to be there as a positive force and keep them in the area they're at with you and keep them doing their regular activities and make it positive. So what we've been able to do is to uh, create a whole de-escalation continuum with a wide and a deep selection of skills that staff have to use first with a youth who's acting out long before isolation can even be considered or requested. So they cannot immediately go, unless it's a very dangerous situation, they have to go through the continuum first. At the same time, we also had our line staff begin to participate more in our treatment programming as well as the whole treatment process. So they would have a fuller picture of the youth that they're working with. And what came out of that was a, the joint understanding and cooperation program that we've implemented. The focus of this program is to show students how staff think inside of a facility and to show staff how students view their time in the facility. Staff and students uh, first spend a few days getting separate training to focus on the importance of role modeling and redirecting behaviors. But then they come together and train together um, so that they can learn how to reinforce each other's positive behaviors and keep each other's perspectives in mind. And, and the, I think the best thing about that program is both students and staff become facilitators of the next group that go through. So it's both student and staff run, which I think has made a huge difference at our facilities. As Fairboards had noticed, no, noted before, you can put everything in policy and say you're going to do things, but if you're not monitoring and looking at your data to drive your practice, um, a, a lot of times you could end up with everything on paper and that's about it. And we definitely decided to use our data to drive practices. So we incorporated performance-based standards or PBS into the foundation and culture of our facilities. And really, uh, in the years that this has happened, it's now to the point where it's become our way of doing business, basically. I mean, it is, it is exactly how we do everything is PBS-based. I think most importantly, uh, to get uh, staff buy-in, especially veteran staff buy-in, we started sharing data with all of our staff, which helped them understand the reasons behind the changes we were making, and to this day, the changes that we continue to make. We constantly involve our line staff in that. I think what happened uh, in the early days is being able to see that we were way above the national average for isolation use, and especially for duration of isolation, was, was very impactful to our staff. Our staff could now see that other states and other agencies had significantly reduced the use of isolation without increasing incidents or risking safety, which allowed us to start asking in Indiana, well, why can't we do the same? And eventually, I think this data helped reduce the fear that reducing isolation would then result in a corresponding increased risk to staff. It just it didn't happen. And, but having that initial data from other states and agencies helped us convince staff that it could be done. Our superintendents also work different hours to meet with groups of staff on all shifts. They show them all the PBS reports, they ask for their ideas on making changes and improvements, 
and then those staff can directly participate and develop and meeting uh, our facility action plan. So they become responsible parties for the very plans that they help create. And that also helped in with a lot of buy-in. Um, we also uh, have added daily incident monitoring meetings that we conduct where department heads come together. They discuss all the incidents and uses of isolation from the day before. They review them. They make sure that all of our processes were in place and that staff made every effort to keep youth out of isolation. These meetings also give staff the ability to bring everyone together to sort of brainstorm what might be going on with the youth behaviors and actions. So we have custody there and mental health, treatment staff, admin staff. But then the whole team comes together to work out a plan for helping the youth so that every department has a piece in the plan to help that youth, that youth change their behavior. We also focus on a continual improvement process. We don't, we focus on PBS data every month. We don't do it just during data drop months. We have a PBS facility report that each facility submits monthly with all of the PBS outcome measures on it. And this way, by measuring it monthly, we can celebrate successes on a regular basis and, and to targeted rewards for staff and facilities that really go out of their way to make changes. Um, especially in the areas of decreasing isolation and addressing problems. Um, because we're constantly measuring and reporting, PBS also helps us recognize what is working now for Indiana. And I, I don't have it up here on the slide, but for example, uh, in, in the PBS standard order number eight, which talks about decreasing the frequency and number of isolation uses, Indiana went down 64.7% from April of 2009 to October of 2015. And currently, we are 65% below the field average. Um, even more telling in order number nine, which is the average duration of isolation, room confinement, and segregation, we were able to decrease from 2.04 hours in 2009 to 0.72 hours in 2015. And this represents an 87.2% decrease in just that little amount of time. Currently, for October of 2015, the field average is 15.3 hours, while we were at 3.07 hours, which puts us another 79.5% below the field average. And I know it's throwing out a lot of numbers and there's no slide to go with it, but what, what's important is as we see that data coming back, we can see what's working. And this is telling us that the changes we've made in addressing isolation has resulted in improvement. And so again, PBS gives us, gives us direct evidence of what we're doing. We also began engaging families to help us reduce isolation. We opened up visitation, visitation days and hours to allow visits every day and at any time that's convenient for families. Prior to this, we had very limited days and hours that families could come. We also implemented conference calls with families to discuss reasons for isolation. So for example, if a youth does have to be put in isolation, we contact the family and do a family session over the phone. In this way, the youth can talk to their family about the incident. The staff can also talk with the family, but then the entire group can work together to collaborate on strategies to help the youth make better decisions that don't result in them being isolated. We also increased uh, collaborative family sessions with facility counselors and our juvenile reintegration specialists who are our juvenile parole staff. So we're also trying to, before students are released, have the families and parole come together to meet with our facility staff to plan things out and work with um, engaging the student while they're still in the facility and after release. And we find that having that, that constant contact from the people who will be taking care of the youth next makes youth feel uh, more empowered that people are caring about them, which also has resulted in, in less incidents. We have um, created several different family councils and facility events for families. So our superintendents themselves give facility tours for families all the way to where the, their child is sleeping. So they go all the way to their bed, um, where they eat, where they do programming, and it's led by our superintendents. We have parent-teacher conferences in education. We do graduation celebrations with cap and gown. We have family days, which can really are fun. We can do cookouts and just involve the family in having fun with their youth. Uh, but we also have family tie sessions which um, mental health staff and facility counselors and even the students themselves teach their families what skills they're learning in our treatment groups so that the families can be aware of how they can help their student when they're released. We also provide volunteer activities uh, to give back to communities that families and youth can participate in. 
and we're constantly every every month trying to brainstorm and come up with uh, new ideas to involve families and, and really getting input from the families and the kids themselves. And we find that that helps reduce isolation because the students um, are, again, are feeling more in contact, that everyone cares about how they're feeling and what they're doing. Finally, uh, again, to, to really move forward, we had to commit to culture change um, on the ground you know, with the field staff. And so we implemented some other things. We, we began to have more of a unit team concept. And this way, that, as I said earlier, treatment staff and youth development specialists work more closely together. But now uh, we, we involve them in what the treatment interventions are, and we involve them in our treatment review team so that they can get a sense of what the youth need to do. Even our mental health staff, uh, they run much more programs now for youth than they used to, and they give out skill cards to the facility staff to help them, you know, let a student know this student is going to be needing some time out time. He, he may ask for it. He may ask for a moment to pause, or he might step out of line movement and just calm himself down and get right back into line movement. And so we, we constantly talk with staff so that they know what the students are trying to do with positive skills. We then um, implemented what we call the CARE team. And the CARE team is the Crisis Awareness Response Effort Team. And they are now our first responders um, rather than QRT, our quick response team. Uh, QRT, really, their typical response was to come in, use force, and put a kid in isolation. Instead of sending QRT, we send the care team. They are specially trained staff who um, can come in if the line staff call for assistance to, to help a youth de-escalate in that moment and in that same area. Um, it, it, line staff report it sort of helps students have somebody fresh to talk to who they might not be angry with or upset with. Um, it gives a chance for everyone to, to do some de-escalation and, and some uh, conflict res resolution and calm down, and then the student can go right back to what they were working on. And so we find care team to be, to be very effective for that. We also implemented a staff shadowing program in place of isolation. So if a youth is having a, a bad day or is having just general difficulty adjusting or getting along with others, we will place a staff person by their side for the whole day. And that staff person follows the youth to school, recreation, and programming. And they're trained to help the youth use skills to cope with their day or whatever issues that they're having. So there's where mental health might give some ideas, and then we, we pair a staff person with that student to walk around and help them use their skills. And then finally, um, we also started a student council at each facility so that we can give youth a voice in decisions, improving facility life, and looking at what incentives could help motivate them to, to have behavior change. Just to, to kind of tie things up here, um, with all the processes that we've put in place to reduce isolation, we've reduced our segregation beds at all the facilities. Um, in fact, one facility was even able to close an entire segregation unit and turn it into a reentry unit set up like a college dorm with all types of extra freedoms and privileges for kids who are getting ready to go home. Another facility is down to just using one timeout room for the entire facility. And I think with all the changes we've done and having PBS, our staff now report that it's second nature to engage in um, and not isolate a youth who are in crisis or who are upset and need de-escalation. Um, in fact, our staff members now prefer to help the youth de-escalate so that everyone can continue on with their regular activities. And again, as to echo Fairborse, and before we move on to Peter, I just want to add, please take things slowly. This, this didn't happen overnight. Um, do it gradually and definitely get ideas from staff and reward them. But uh, I'd like to turn it over to Peter now. Mark, thank you very much. That, that was excellent. Uh, Fair boys, thank you. I hope my, um, my comments flow from what you've already heard. Uh, that was very helpful. Um, so my name is Peter Forbes. I'm the commissioner of DYS in Massachusetts. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Policy and data, two very um, important pieces of this that Mark and Fairboss both touched on. And I think, you know, what happened in Massachusetts, we've been at this now since 2004, 2005, and then really 2008, 2009. Um, and for us, the, the uh, Fairboss used the word paradigm. The paradigm for us was really safety and not punishment. Um, because we were in a situation where we had a lot of kids that were harming themselves in their rooms, 
Uh, we had ongoing um, suicide attempts. We had two completed suicides. 2003 and 2004, we had two youth complete suicides in our secure facilities. So we really came at this from a safety standpoint, and that, for me, is a much healthier approach than the punishment box or the punishment paradigm. Um, and I don't think there, there's there's a lot of, you know, there's, there's not a real strong counter argument to want everybody wanting staff and kids to be safe. The question is, how do you get there? Um, and one of the things that was helpful to us was we um, we tapped into a guy named Lindsey Hayes, who's a national expert on suicide and self-harm in juvenile facilities. And he wrote a couple of papers that were extremely helpful um, to us. And in one, his first article talked about the fact that when kids are confined to their rooms, they're apt to act impulsively and do things that they would otherwise not do. So by putting a kid in, in their room, you solve one problem, which is the eye control behavior on the program, and you create another challenge, which is that youth safety in their room. Um, so that becomes, you know, uh, a, a, another road into this whole change process. <clears throat> and I think Fierbo's point about making the case, I mean, if you want to make the change, you have to make the case. The other piece that, that has been really um, something that we've relied on a lot here in Massachusetts has been, you know, nationally the juvenile justice agencies are becoming more data-driven and more outcome-focused. And you're not going to get good outcomes for kids if you keep them in their rooms. There's no win there. Uh, so room confinement has to be used to, to diffuse um, an unsafe situation, and then it has to be undone as quickly as, as, as can be safely done. And to the extent that we want kids to um, make positive change, then they have to be in class, they have to be in groups, they have to have an opportunity to interact with staff. And that's really... Um, you know, that's been our approach to it, and that's, you know, from a, you know, a leadership and marketing standpoint, it's been really helpful. Um, when you get to the issue of policy and policy change, um, I'll just echo, I think Fairboys and Mark both, both touched on it, but it's really, um, really important to be inclusive and make sure that we are we are an organized state, so our workforce is um, has a collective bargaining unit and has a local that represents them. Um, it's important to get the um, union on board to the table, to get staff, to get to get a field-based leadership on board, and to spend time in the if possible, spend time in the policy formulation with your stakeholders. Um, and that was something that, you know, we, if, if, we, if I had that back, we probably would have been more thorough at that stage, but we, we certainly did a piece of that. Um, and then when it comes to change, sometimes we rush in and set implementation dates that are unrealistic, you know, in order to, you know, structure it and set limits on ourselves. And I think that we have to be careful about that um, because we have to um, allow some time for this change to actually take place. And, you know, one of the things that, that we've done in Massachusetts is on big policies like this, where you're going to redo your room confinement policy, what we've done is set the implementa implementation date 100 days out. So you know now that this policy is going to change on June 1st. And then do your, uh, so that then you're deliberative and structured about making sure you do your outreach to the field. And it's really important that this kind of a policy doesn't get communicated by getting dropped in everybody's mailbox or statewide email that goes out to everybody that they're expected to just make the change. It's really important that staff, uh, um, leadership, that the staff hear from the leadership and that we get out there and let folks know that this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it, and that we're going to be there to support them. 
And you know, there's a number of ways of doing that, whether you go to shift changes, staff meetings, traditional trainings. If you have a training academy, obviously that's a place to do it. We do it at the academy. We do an annual research on this. Um, but we also, when we rolled this out, went out and met in every single program and talked to all of our staff to the extent that that's possible about what we were doing, why we were doing it, and set a reasonable implementation timeline so that people feel like they have some room to digest this, even if they don't initially agree. And I, you know, our experience was people did not initially agree. We had, you know, we had to work through this, and we're still working through a lot of this. Um, so on slide t number 25, sorry about that, on slide number 25, that's just an excerpt from our policy. We were very clear in the policy that it's prohibited to use room confinement for punitive purposes, and we felt that we had to write that down in a policy and that it wasn't something that we could just uh, talk about. It, it was something that had to be written down because in the event down the road this gets violated or the spirit of this is not going to be accepted in the field, you have to at some point say no, you know, this is a non-negotiable and it's going to be enforced. Um, so we felt it was really important to really put that in the, in the policy. Our policy is available if anybody wants it. I certainly can get that to you, the whole policy. Um, so the other piece of it so policy, you know, is really important, and this is an opportunity to do policy differently, maybe more slowly, more thoroughly, with more input, and get there more gradually so that you can win at the end. Get, get the input so the implementation isn't as tough. When it comes to data, it's critical. We started in Massachusetts with zero data. We had no idea who was in their rooms. We couldn't see it from a, from a central office standpoint how long kids were staying in their rooms, how many kids were in their rooms, what programs. So we initially implemented a really kind of primitive daily call where every program had to call it in to a call center and then we cobbled together um, a daily report that we could look at. And it was very manual. It wasn't in the MIS system. We couldn't run reports on it. And, um, but it began to really bring some, some focus to that and it allowed us to begin to see where, where the trends were, where the usage was. Um, and, you know, what, I think there's a saying that says, um, what counts, what you count counts. I'm not sure if that's the exact saying, but if you don't have the data, you'll never be able to measure prog progress and see how you're doing. And it's also very important to be able to break it down to the program level so that you can see which living units and which programs are using the room confinement. And what we found early on is from a data integrity standpoint, you'll see certain programs reporting no room confinement. That doesn't mean there's no room confinement. That means that they're not reporting it. So you have to be able to figure out a way to see that and then have those conversations with the programs about what's going on uh, behind the numbers. So that's, you know, so we, and we've worked on that for a period of years to the point where we now have it all in our management information system, which is called JGEM. All of the programs enter it in. We have a daily report. We have a monthly dashboard. We're constantly looking at room confinement, restraint, assault, injury, all of, all of the negative risk indicators as well as the positive indicators. We have a management report that, that covers educational progress, um, sustained employment in the community, a lot of the positive indicators, and then we also have a section that we're looking at our risk indicators, inclu including room confinement. And we get a lot of mileage out of that. Um, so going to slide 27, um, uh, Mark talked about PBS. We have... Um, a lot of our programs in PBS, not all of our programs, but it's important to be able to understand some sense of how you are doing relative to other programs. And PBS actually lets you look at yourself relative to other states. This particular slide shows the state, uh, the national average, and then it shows the DYS average um, based on uh, the number of room confinements. So we're we're trending low. I, I want it to be much lower than that. 
um, but at least we can see through that process how those programs are doing, and then um, the duration. So duration is, is really important. Um, for us, it's, it's right now it's around an, uh, one hour on average across all our programs, which is consistent with this slide. Um, and I'm not sure. I mean, PBS is one place to look. I'm not sure what the right duration for a timeout to, to make sure that the youth in, in, in the program is safe. But somewhere in that half hour to an hour range, to me, seems like a lot of kids can calm down. Not all. Um, some kids will remain agitated. And one of the things that we spent a fair amount of time on in Massachusetts, and we didn't know this going into it, how to, you know, really how to do this, is the whole concept of how do you get kids out. So the number of incidents re involving requiring room confinement is important. And then the duration, how long kids stay in their rooms is as important in a lot of ways. And then, so how do you work with the field to change that whole dynamic of, no, he's calm now, or she's calm now, and we're going to bring him out. We're going to open the door. We're going to assess whether or not he's actually calm, interact with the kid, test that out, have them come out of their room, maybe not go into the main you know, day room, or maybe not go right back into class, but come out of their room, and then try to figure out some interim strategies to um, help them work their way back in to be, you know, more uh, mainstream with the rest of the kids. And that was a really, that actually became one of the things that the, the, the exit strategy became one of the things that we spent probably about six months working with the, our, our union, which is AFSCME Local 1368. We did a piece of work with them. And it was great because we were able to kind of join forces on that particular issue. They were interested in that, and we worked with them on that. So trying to find ways to work with your workforce um, to, to problem solve this is really important. Um, Mark did a really nice job on what Indiana has done. Um, I actually, Mark, I actually saw the uh, JUPC or J, J, yeah, JUPC. Um, demonstrated when we went out to Indianapolis with TJCA. And I just thought that was a really powerful, innovative idea to get staff and kids together um, in a way that helps build up insight on either side of the aisle. We've used DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy. DBT is, um, is, is a place where um, the Staff, our line staff are co-facilitating those groups, and it's, a, it's been a very productive process for us. I'm not saying that you should do it, but it worked for us, and we do it in all of our programs, uh, and it's become a tool that's been helpful in managing this. We've gone to a more positive incentive-based programming approach. Uh, we moved away from the point and level system. You know, we. So the traditional system up here, anyways, was kids would wake up with 100 points, and they'd lose their points all day long for infractions. And for us, that became a really toxic, um, a really toxic environment for certain kids that just couldn't navigate that and didn't have the ability to manage that process. So you always had kids that were sitting in the chair, on the bench, out of program, on room restriction, um, because they just got so frustrated. But trying to find strategies to get kids to invest on the positive side and rewarding them to the extent that that is possible, um, that's been a, a big piece of what we've done here in Massachusetts. Um, we've done a lot. We also have done the, uh, a, a huge piece on family. I'm interested in what um, Indiana has done. Uh, but we've done a big piece of family engagement and getting families more engaged in how they're um, sons and daughters are doing in the programs and, 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 and working with them in that context. Um, I could go on about that. But we've, we've done, and it's all taken time. We didn't have a really strong plan on how we were going to replace room confinement when we took this journey. We, 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 we really didn't have all that figured out, and I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of stuff available nationally. Sharon, actually, who's on this call, had done a really nice summary from a recent um, technical assistance um, on things that 
the, the involved states had suggested or tried or are doing. I thought it was really practical and very informative and probably very useful to the people that are on this call. Um, so that's, I mean, that's it. Mark talked about, you know, the whole positive youth development construct. We've spent a lot of time in Massachusetts training on the adolescent brain development and the fact that, that 17 and 18 year olds are not uh, fully mature and that we need to um, have developmentally appropriate programming for kids, motivational in interviewing, um, and really trying to equip staff and create the environment where staff can engage with youth because our security, our best security for all of us is staff that can appropriately engage and interact with kids and develop that rapport. That's really what we should be focused on. And I think that's that's my piece of it. So I'm going to turn it back to Brendan or to Ned. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. And thank you to all of our pre presenters, Sarah Boys, uh, Peter and Mark. And um, yes, questions have been coming in. And uh, we have some time to address them right now. Uh, this question came in from Alaska very early on in the uh, presentations this afternoon, and I hope, because uh, I could hear some of the presentations addressing the whole leadership issue. But I'm going to ask Fairboys, because I've seen Fairboys present on this to his colleagues in CJCA in uh, our Leadership Institute. So Fairboys, the question is, what leadership actions have been the most effective to reduce isolation or room confinement practices? Uh, thank you, Ned. That's a great question. And, you know, I think that Peter and Mark can reflect on it probably better than I can because they're way ahead of us. They started many years before we started down this path. But from my own experience, really, an organization is not too much different than an organism, like the body. You know, it, it, everything is connected. And to the extent that there are obstruction, that there are, um, you know, points where actually a message is being blocked from what we intend to do, if that message is not getting to the frontline staff, then we begin to suffer. So what has been most effective is to make sure that the various layers of the organization, that this message is completely understood and embraced by our executive team, we talk about this in our um, joint managers meeting where all of the managers come together and talk about this. We actually have quarterly conversations that a team is dispatched to every unit and we begin to ask both youth and the staff a series of questions. Getting the staff feedback is incredibly important, you know, to have an open culture in an environment where staff feel comfortable going to the highest level of the organization, but at the same time understand that they should start at the local level. And again, if their message is not getting through, if they feel that the local uh, leadership is not being effective, then they can go to the next level. Uh, one of the most important aspects of this is for us to show genuine concern that we are caring and concerned about the safety of staff because the very first anxiety that comes up for a staff who's doing this work is how is this change going to impact my safety and security? Am I going to feel secure next day when I'm walking into the front doors of this facility or institution? Um, now, you know, expressing that support uh, is one thing, actually doing something about it, making sure that staff's concerns are addressed, and again, Peter and Mark can take, can talk um, more confidently about this than I can. Um, but you know, in a nutshell, it's really keeping the organization connected, uh, listening to staff, taking their feedback, um, processing it, providing them the support uh, that they need, and and making sure that as we move along, um, you know, this line of sight and this continuity um, actually works both ways. That what we are saying is communicated to the staff who's actually doing the work on the front line, and their feedback is actually getting back to us as the leadership of the organization so we can make the necessary changes. So Mark or Peter, do you want to uh, add anything to that? 
Uh, this is Mark. I, I would agree with that completely. I mean, we, we try very hard to continually elicit, especially our, our line staff, our custody staff, the youth development specialists who, who have the most time and interaction with the students. Um, before we quote unquote take anything away or what might be perceived as being take, taken away an old policy or an old way of doing things, we always come out with what we'd like to do instead and we, we pilot that and we talk about it and then we slowly move to using those new ideas and then de reducing the use of the older ideas. So that way staff are sort of eased into the change. And we found that that, that helps out a lot more. They, they can, that way they can see that the new things are working for them and then we can get their feedback before we officially move into the, to an official change in policy. And that, that helped us out a lot. Right. And, uh, for, me, for, for me on this one, Ned, I, I, I think that, you know, somewhat repeating myself, I believe that this is not, this type of policy change, at least from my perspective and my experience, is not something that can be delegated down. It's something that at the top of the agency and throughout the management ranks, you have to get out there and, 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 and meet people and talk to people and confront this issue because it requires change and a lot of people, once they hear it from you directly and have an opportunity to ask questions or be in a forum where questions are being asked, they can get on board. But this is not the email, the statewide email or the memo in the box. This is, this is something that's going to require some real um, face time. You have to get in your car and drive out and meet with people and talk to people. And um, the other thing that I would say about leadership on this issue, and Fabo has actually referenced it, is it's not a bright line to the finish. You know, there are going to be some places where you might get set back or you might get, you know, um, delayed in different places, and you just have to keep forging ahead and, um, and understand where you need to get to. No, I think all three of you have really given great insights. Having having run an agency, actually I ran the agency Peter's running right now, um, I always felt that if I got out to the field and talked to people about what we wanted to do, uh, even if they didn't totally uh, agree with you, the fact that they had an opportunity to tell you what some of the issues they felt were and then that you did something about them, um, you, you got much more support than, as Peter said, sending out that, that um, impersonal email or um, directive out of central office. Um, the next question is, is going to be to Mark in Indiana. Um, it's on the Joint Understanding Cooperation Program. Uh, when we met, when the uh, CJCA directors met in Indianapolis last summer, we were privileged to have some of the youths and the staff who worked together in this program come over to our hotel on early on a Sunday morning uh, during um, our uh, positive youth outcomes meeting, uh, Peter is uh, the chair of that, and uh, he remembers. And the kids did, and the staff did, a, did kind of a role playing of uh, how that program works. So, Mark, the question from Nebraska to you is, if you could touch a little more on the joint understanding and cooperation program and why that's effective. In, uh, yeah, I think what we, what we do with it is that you know we bring. Um, I think the very first day of the training, the, both the, the students who are selected to participate and the staff who are selected to participate, and you know, and we've been growing this at each facility. So every time we add new, everyone, you know, staff are encouraged to sort of um, dress down, just kind of come in, very relaxed. The, the students can kind of come in. We we don't um, we break it up so that everyone is sitting with each other, so it's not just staff congregating at one table or one set of desks in the classroom and the youth are on the other side. We purposely bring, uh, constantly move the groups around so that they're interacting with each other. And then a lot of what was done in the early days of the, when the program was created um, was, to elit, was to talk to students who are currently in the facilities at the time to get their mindset. And then we're also asking the current ones in the program does that still ring true for you? And, and then the staff, it's the same way. And so um, what, they, what they sort of do the first two days, it's a three-day training, the first two days are really um, learning what the others have talked about in, in the past. So here, here is a, the perspective of the students that we trained the staff. 
here's what you need to be aware of. Here, when they do this, this is what the thinking that goes behind that is. And then at the same time in those two days, the students are learning. This is what staff, when staff are saying this, this is what they're talking about. This is their perspective. But then um, I think it's that third day that's the most powerful, where we bring them together to discuss issues, current issues going on. It can even be with a particular unit. So it can be the staff from a unit as well as the students on that unit just working together. What are the current problems going on and how can we um, better support each other's mindset and, and also reward that behavior. And so it, it's really teaching them how to communicate and, and how to um, give each other time to adjust. And, and we find that that works well. And, and as I said at the end, I think the most powerful piece is utilizing students as trainers in the class as well. So they teach the, the adults, the staff, and I think that's very powerful both for that student and to help the staff see the kids in a different light. And, I, and, I, and doing those role plays, constant role plays where they switch uh, perspectives get, gives them, and, and we talked about hands-on learning, um, it, it gives each group uh, uh, off of paper. It's really, you have to in the moment think about, well, how might if I were the student, how would I be reacting? And so those, those flipping of roles and doing those role plays makes it very real. And, and you know, it, it's a safe place too, so everyone's kind of safe to say, um, this is really how you act sometimes, Mr. You know, <laughs> youth Development Specialist. And so, I mean, we kind of get to see outside of ourselves as a staff person how the kids are perceiving us. And I think that's powerful. And we make sure it's very safe for kids to do that. I don't know if that completely answers the question, but <laughs> I think that that's what we found powerful about it. And by the way, uh, for those who are on the on the call, if um, if you want to get more information, you certainly can ask Mark. But we also did a a blog on the CJCA website. Uh, the meeting was in August, so the blog came out probably in uh, late August or September. If you want to look up our archives, uh, they're all all the uh, blogs are are um, there, um, and uh, you can find out more about the uh, program. Uh, and we'd be know. happy to share in Indiana with anybody. Great, great, okay. Um, so, so Mark, just to continue with you, so, so when you first um, began to introduce ways to reduce the use of isolation and moving the, uh, the culture uh, in that direction, did you see a decrease pretty quickly in the use, use of isolation, or was there a blip up and then it settled down? What was your experience in that? Um, I, at the time, when, when this was all implemented, I was working, I'm in, in central office now as a program director, but I was a program director at the South Bend Juvenile Facility and, and experienced it firsthand. No, we definitely, um, I think, saw an increase as staff, some staff, it's kind of ironic, so when, when staff kind of got wind that this was happening, they started using isolation more to prove, quote unquote, that they needed it. And so, you know, we saw an uptick in the use of it with staff who were very worried about losing it. And I think as we made, you know, and it, it continues, it's something that we measure all the time. And so there can be, you know, in the very beginning, it, it took a long time to convince staff that um, they would be safe. And, and well, what do we do? If we can't put a kid in SAG for five days, for, uh, for fighting somebody or assaulting someone or three days, you know, what are we going to do with them? And so I think it took a long time with our veteran staff to, to bring training to them to then make sure that the supervisors and, and those of us in training and in central office came often to, to help them do real scenarios. And we, we've added since then, um, one of the things that came out of those early days of training was staff said, well, this is great, you know, we, we're glad we have all these, these de-escalation techniques, but we'd like some real-world examples of using them. And so we added a full scenario training to all of the trainings, and that way staff can, much like the JUCP program, have it happen in real time and talk about incidents that they feel would happen. So no, it's been a very, um, it was a very rocky road to begin with. It, it took us a long time to figure out um, that it, that it could work, and, and we've done it incrementally. So, you know, we're we're still, I mean, as of last week, tweaking our policy on isolation as 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 the facilities become more comfortable with each piece. So, 
you know, we, we, we tried to focus on areas of, of concern, um, deal with those high priority ones first, and then, you know, move more towards sort of the lesser reasons why kids end up in isolation or kind of the, let's just put him in timeout. He's acting up, let's, he's acting up in school, let's throw him in a timeout room. So now we're, we're down to the, okay, now let's, let's think about that. That too is isolation. Can we, can we reduce that and, and getting staff input? So it's a constant up and down battle. And I think that's where, again, PBS helps us. So every facility is constantly tracking their use of isolation. They can watch for patterns. They can see if maybe we lose a lot of staff on a shift and we hire a lot of new ones and they're struggling and isolation goes up. Well, now we know we can go address that shift. And we can watch for the patterns of when is isolation occurring and when isn't it. Um, you know, I think that, and, and coming up with more ideas on, well, what can we do with a student who, who is escalated at the moment? How can we keep them engaged? And, you know, we've, um, it can even be just, I think the care team helps out a lot. The care team concept, um, staff felt like, well, if you're taking isolation away from us, but you've got people trained and on a schedule to come assist us, de-escalate a kid, that was, the, I think, the game changer. We didn't have care teams at first. And that helped out that, that we're not, if, we're, if we take away isolation, we're giving you other staff who are specially trained to de-escalate the kids. They'll take them to the side, talk with them, do some uh, conflict resolution with you, and we can get that student right back into class or on the unit or whatever they were doing. And so I would definitely recommend looking into care teams because then staff feel like we're not forgetting them. We're not taking something away and then just leaving them hanging. Good. Uh, thank you. Uh, Peter, this is a question for you. It's uh, from Los Angeles County about the uh, schools uh, in their facilities. And just so I happen to know this, um, the LA, um, in the juvenile halls, the uh, LA Unified School District uh, provides the education. So it's the county school system that provides the education for the youth in the facilities. So the question, Peter, is how do the schools in your facilities work with you to support your efforts? So we have a We lost Peter. I, I don't believe he's actually still connected. He might have lost the phone connection there. Okay, so we'll come back to Peter. Um, just uh, to follow through on that um, question is that in Massachusetts, a private agency actually is under contract to run the school. So there's some comparability there between LA County and Massachusetts. Um, but hopefully Peter, Peter will get back to us. But I'm gonna to move to the next question. So for those uh, with detention facilities, pretrial detention, uh, are you allowing youth to place themselves in timeout when they prefer to sleep in after breakfast for an hour or two, or do you force them into the program in the day room with the rest of the population? The only trouble with that question is that Peter is the only one that runs pretrial detention. The other two jurisdictions, counties run the pretrial detention. So I'm gonna skip over that one too until we hear back. So. The next question is from South Carolina um, to e any of you, uh, either, um, well, let's have Fairboys respond to this. How do you create buy-in from the direct care or what's called the frontline staff? Thank you, Peter. Uh, uh, thank you, Ned. And um, the great question, I mean, really, <laughs> there is no way that we can move this change if we don't have buy-in from the frontline staff. Uh, there are a thousand and one ways to sabotage transformation and, um, you know, frontline staff ultimately are a whole lot smarter than I am in this business. So um, the, the way that you create buy-in, at least my experience has been, is that you have to be authentic. You have to come across as addressing the real concerns of the frontline staff. You have to help them see what we're seeing. What and we, you know, all three of us have talked about this, is that they have to be able to understand why we're doing this, and they have to be able to understand that the world is changing, and then there are new um, knowledge emerging that helps us actually keep them safer by putting this stuff in place. Um, we need to show them that it's actually possible. You know, I have, um, our staff have monthly conversations with folks in Missouri. 
um, you know, if you have questions, we can call folks in Indiana or in Massachusetts or in other places to connect our staff with their staff who've already gone through experience like this. Uh, and, you know, ultimately, if they can hear from their counterparts, their colleagues in other states who've actually successfully done this, the more that they understand this stuff is real, the more there, um, there is a probability and possibility that they can buy in. Um, uh, you know, training becomes really important. As I said, uh, if we are asking our staff to do things differently, we have to provide them with the tools and the training that they need in order to do the job. So, um, and the staff ask for this all the time. And then one other piece that I want to briefly talk about is the whole concept of staffing. In many of our organizations and facilities, we don't have the appropriate staffing ratio in order to be able to manage living units. If we have two or three staff that are dealing with 50 youth, there is no way that you can manage that environment if a fight breaks out, if an argument breaks out, or um, if there is disruption. Many of us have adopted the policy of isolation basically to keep staff and youth safe. So as we begin to examine our uh, environment, our culture, um, and our operations, it's also important to know uh, do we have enough staff to address the situation? And that goes a long way um, for the staff to trust that you're actually putting the right resources um, and the right attention to the problem. Thank you, Farah Boris. And I understand Peter is back. And so, Peter, the question was from LA County on um, how the schools, um, uh, how do the schools in your facilities work with you? To support your efforts, and when when we uh, when uh, your connection broke, I mentioned that you have a contracted system, so there is some comparability between uh, your working with a contractor and LA County working with the LA Unified School System. Yeah, sorry about that. I picked the phone up. Um, so we have a contract with a collaborative that provides educational services across all of our programs. And I think that's a different um, arrangement because we, you know, we um, we're the we hold the contract and they're the service provider, so they're accountable to the contract. And they want to keep their um, customer happy. Um, so I think that's a little different than having the school district come in, where the accountability is really more of a partnership than than a, a contractor provider relationship. But all that said, we run small classrooms. Um, our educational setup, our average classroom is about six, six to eight kids. We always have a direct care staff in the classroom that works as essentially a support to the teacher. They're not strictly viewed as security. Um, and the, the, the educational staff, the teachers, are really on board with us around classroom strategies to keep kids in the class because a lot of times the behavioral stuff um, does generate from classroom and from teachers not feeling safe and from kids acting out in class. That certainly contributes to room confinement across the country. That's been our experience. Um, but small classrooms, solid staffing ratios, which I, I hate to talk about because I'm, you know, I understand that everybody's not where we are. And um, you know, working with your educational staff around, you know, shared shared goals and. Our teachers have been wonderful um, trying to be creative about keeping kids in class. Great. Thank you, Peter. Um, and one, a question. one more thing I would add on that, Ned, uh, for sure. Los Angeles, is that our teaching, our teaching force, our workforce, they're also organized um, and represented by a collective bargaining uh, agreement and a local. So we can't just do what we want. We have to work with them, too around um, conditions of employment and their workplace safety. Great. Thank you, Peter. Um, so the question from Sedgwick County um, in uh, Kansas, um, I think Faribor has dealt with it, but I just want to mention it because Peter talked about staffing as well. But did the ratios on the successful facilities have to change, meaning the staffing ratios have to change? Did staffing change? to be successful and accommodate all the changes. 
And I think we've heard of the importance of, a, of having a, an appropriate ratio of st uh, staff to, to youth ratio. But one thing I want to add before I just throw it open um, to, the, to the directors who um, have dealt with this is that um, numbers don't get it alone. You absolutely do have to have the appropriate level uh, and number of staff. But it's the quality of the staff, the energy of the staff, the commitment of the staff, and the training that the staff receive, I think, that is the difference maker in um, being successful, especially when you're changing culture, practices, and policies. So I just want to give that from my own experience in the past. But uh, does anyone want to say anything more on the ratios? Well, one, one, one comment that I would make in addition to what you said, this is Peter, um, is that the numbers, all of what you said is 100% on point, the, but the numbers do matter because the, the, the staffing patterns that we have, it, it's, it's one to five on, on, on awake shifts and one to, one to seven on the overnight, overnight shift. But what, what a, a good staffing pattern allows for is, in addition to what you said, Ned, is the ability to pull a kid aside and talk to them and, right. spe and actually spend time. You know, if you don't have 20 minutes to spend de-escalating a kid, then you're going to get you're going to get to use of force and you're going to get to room confinement. So, so uh, we we have the I won't say the luxury, but we have the the organization the setup up here that we have staff on deck that can actually sit and talk to a kid, pull a kid aside, and actually process out. And sometimes that's going to take time, um, but it's time that's invested because once you get into a restraint or you get into an incident of room confinement or any kind of use of force. That the whole day goes downhill for that kid, for that staff, and potentially for others around that. So to be able to spend 20 to 30 minutes to sit and talk to a kid and actually process what's going on is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a really rich opportunity, and not everybody has that. No, I, re I realize that I had the luxury of being the commissioner um, many years before Peter, and I'll have to say the executive branch and the legislature have always been supportive because Massachusetts runs very small programs and they've been very supportive of the staffing. The only time we had some serious problems when the uh, juvenile crimes uh, rate spiked was when we had a lot of overcrowding. But when the facilities are at the budget, budgeted and rated capacities, um, it, is a, it is a very, very good staffing ratio. And staff are able to do what Peter was just talking about, to concentrate on a particular youth who is who's having some issues. Um, we're, we're getting close to our uh, wrap-up time, so uh, maybe this will be the lightning round. Um, what kind of programming and incentives are offered to keep youth out of the rooms? Any, any one of you can respond to that. Um, in Indiana, we uh, are, when we have our care teams, the care teams are trained in uh, different types of de-escalation techniques. It's really, we added it up one time, we had six pages, single spaced, of techniques that they can utilize, that they're trained in. And, you know, a lot of it's motivational interviewing. And I, I do have to agree with Peter, echo Peter, that having that time to just take the kid to the side is very important um, because no matter what generic incentives you put in place, there's nothing more powerful than taking a kid aside and, and giving that he, him or her that attention. Uh, that, that we've got some time, we want to talk to you, find out what's going on with you, and let's work this out. I think that, that's a big key. Um, other incentives, you know, we, we, we do, we run a full token economy system um, that, that, and as we were talking earlier, it doesn't take away points, you're, you're earning points constantly, so there's incentives to, to do well, um, to have second chances, every program. Um, that we run does offer kids, you know, if they had a rough beginning of a month but they're doing well, then we're going to take that into account. Um, we also have been using dialectical behavior therapy quite a bit uh, with our mental health staff, uh, training our line staff and treatment staff to use those techniques with students to help them when they're in crisis. So DBT does help quite a bit. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, Peter, this is a question to you. Um, the person 
is in a system that has officers, Massachusetts doesn't, you have direct care staff, but are the officers slash direct care staff allowed to assist the teachers in the classroom as, for, as far as quieting the youth down, or do the officers, direct care staff, just let the teachers do everything? No, it's, it's very much, um, we've evolved to, to really a team. For a long time, we couldn't make the commitment to actually have a direct care staff in, in the room with the teacher. But we've, we've evolved to the point of where we pretty much have that in place in every classroom where there's a direct care staff there, an officer in the, in, in the room. And it's a real partnership between, where it works well, it's a real partnership between the line staff and the teacher. And you'll see, um, if you come into our programs, you'll actually see the staff working with a, a kid um, or supporting the teacher. They'll also tell the kids to keep it down or knock it off um, and be proactive about behavioral expectations in, 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 the, in the classroom. But it's more than just limit setting. It's really encouraging um, the education to go on. It's taken us a long time to get there, and part of that has been working with our educational contract to encourage that model. And it's, it's really, it's, it, to me, it, 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 it feels like the, the, the right setup. So we're pretty happy with the way it's going. I wanted to piggyback on what Peter was saying. We, you know, we have a different setup in our schools, but um, we also find that we do every week the uh, education department, all the teachers, the principal, uh, the treatment department, the mental health staff, and custody representatives get together at least once a week for an hour, and we discuss any difficult cases that are going on, especially in the school, and effects that, you know, if medications had any changes on students or students that they're worried about. And then there's experts right there who can help the teachers problem solve in their classroom. And we find that that helps, gives them a voice and helps out a lot. At the same time, we're not always able to put um, youth development specialists in the classroom, but we do have uh, one of our treatment staff, at least one, perhaps two, depending on the size of the facility, are scheduled to work in the school building to help a student who needs to come out of the classroom because they're acting up. We, we do some treatment work with them, some DBT, and then we can, and once they de-escalate, we can put them right back in the classroom. So we try to utilize our treatment staff um, as, as almost as school counselors to kind of to be in the school building and help uh, the youth development specialists work with calming the kids down. But, you know, we do expect our teachers to have their behavior plans in place to work with students. But, you know, if it's clearly going to affect the rest of the classroom, we then, we then have those other staff pull the student out. Um, students are also allowed, some of our facilities have mentors, and that can be anyone from a secretary to a cook to any staff member, everybody uh, mentors the kids, so you can also request to speak to your mentor, and, and, and a, sort of a person who can advocate for you and help talk to you, and that helps out in the school building too. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. Well, we're close to wrapping up, and so I just want to, again, thank our uh, our three presenters today, Faribors, Mark, and Peter, um, they have really done it in their jurisdictions, and we're really so pleased that they're willing to share uh, their philosophy, their strategies, and they're um, facing some of the difficult issues uh, that they had to face when they were uh, making the changes and continue to make us because it's never, you're, you're always getting new staff and you're getting new youth, and so it's very important that. Um, you stay up in these things, and they certainly do. So in putting it all together, the, the five steps we recommend to reducing isolation are to have a rehabilitative mission statement and philosophy, to have restrictive isolation policies and procedures, then to monitor with hard data the uh, practice and hold staff accountable, to provide alternative behavior management tools, and to have staff training. Um, so if indeed your jurisdiction is um, trying to make changes, and by the way, the nature of the questions that came in today, and they were very good questions, we got to most of them, we didn't get to all of them, but uh, the questions that came in show that, demonstrate that many of you are e either very seriously contemplating making significant changes in the use of isolation, or you're already, already in the midst of doing it. They were very practical and very pragmatic questions, and I think, our, again, our panelists responded very well to them. And the last uh, housekeeping is Brendan assures me that the emails 
will be in the mail by the end of the week, which will give you a link uh, to the website and the uh, PowerPoints from today's presentation. That's the number one question that we always get. Can I get the PowerPoints? Yes, you're going to get them by the end of the week. And again, uh, if you want to take a look at the toolkit, it made the uh, New York Times bestseller list, not just kidding, um, but the equivalent of it. I think we've had over uh, 12 to 1,500 hits on the website. Uh, the CJCA toolkit, reducing the use of isolation, is on the CJCA website. The um, address is before you, and just go to resources uh, and pub then publications, and you will get, you will get it. So um, thanks very much to Brendan for organizing and uh, executing our webinar today, and thanks to all of you who participated in, in today's webinar. And we'll see you the next time. Thank you.